Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Arwen Lewis on the Arwen Lewis radio show. Today, my very special guest is Grammy Award nominated, Academy Award and Golden Globe winning um, songwriter, John DiNicola. He's a record producer and also a label head for OMAD Records based out of New York City. That's a boutique record label. You can find out more about him at omadrecords.com at john dinicolacom and follow him on Instagram at John Dinicola Music. Today, we're talking about his extensive and accomplished career um, as a musician. And we're hearing about how um, the songs Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes made it into the movie Dirty Dancing. They saved the movie. And anyway, let's pick up with that story, John. So you were telling, talking about um, the performers on Time of My Life. Well, right. And uh, well, the, the, um, the writer, the director, and uh, Patrick Swayze and Jennifer uh, Gray, they, they just, you know, immediately said that's the song we you know we have now we can we have the ending for the movie so now we can you know look forward to the rest of the movie they you know they were just it just in infused an, an excitement into because they knew they had this killer close closing scene yeah which uh you know 35 years later is you know is iconic i mean it's become iconic i mean it's uh, how many times does do you see people doing the lift and nobody puts baby in the corner and all the all the uh you know the pop um icons from that movie um so um and, and it's really evident and when it, there's a, a lot of pl- uh the dirty dancing the play is all over the been all over the world and uh, you really feel it when you're watching the play. It's like we're just waiting for that. Mo- I mean, it's all great, but it's like it's all building to I've had the time of my life. It's such a, a kind of an exuberant, uh, a, a, you know, exultant feel. Um, so that's how that one got in there. And then once, uh, you know, so we kind of lucked out. I mean, I guess they lucked out, too. I mean. As Emil Ardolino, the director, would say, uh, everything came together in that movie. You could never have planned any of it. It's just the sun and the moon and the stars just lined up to make. I mean, it was a really small uh, um, movie um, company of um, Vestron Pictures. They they had mostly just done direct to uh, you know VHS movies. They hadn't really done a big movie. So it, it was kind of beat the odds, the, the whole song, uh, the whole movie. When um, the time of my life got in there and, you know, uh, they they brought us in, Frankie and I, to look at other scenes. They needed a, a song for what turned out to be I Carried a Watermelon, uh, the big dance scene. They needed a song for that, uh, which ended up being uh, Love Man and I forget what the other was, two songs in that scene. We submitted, uh, we had Hungry Eyes already, mm-hmm. right? And we submitted it for that scene. They said, well, you know what? I, it doesn't really work for that scene, but we have an idea for this other scene. And of course, that's the famous, you know, uh, Patrick teaching Jennifer and um, um, I forgot <laughs> what's the other character's name, but the three of them were in there mm-hmm. dancing to Hungry Eyes. Um, can you remember? I can't remember. I can't remember it either. I have I have the maybe, memory of like a P. Maybe Johnny and uh, oh, anyway, I can come. Google it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, there's, there's kind of that uh, menage a trois scene in there where they're they're teaching her how to dance and uh, you know, hungry eyes just work perfectly. And uh, as I as I was told, it, it, with with the arm coming down under her side. That was the laughter that she had was real. She and Patrick was getting annoyed with her because it wasn't supposed to be funny, but she kept giggling, and they kept it in there, obviously. But uh, making the scene, it sounds like that was just a completely synchronistic experience. Well, every it must have been surreal for you too. Well, well, it was. I mean, uh, you know, we you never know what's going to happen, but. You know, when it started to take off, 
um, you know, it was exciting. Um, I remember um, in the beginning, I, I think the, um, you know, the movie started pushing the song and the record sales and all that. And then once the song caught on, it started pushing the movie. It was kind of a symbiotic relationship. I remember the first time I saw, well, the second time I saw it before it was edited. And then I saw it, maybe it was the second time I saw it, even after the edit. Uh, I was in a theater near my home, up, Upper West Side in New York City at the time. And I, um, you know, I, I watched to the credits, of course. I was watching the credits and, and I, I noticed a bunch of people in front of me sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And they go, oh, that that's the song, the time of my life, that's the song. <laughs> so I figured we had something happening there. Well, definitely. And I feel like that's a soundtrack will make a, a good soundtrack will make a movie and vice versa, because people can relive the experience of being caught up in the story through the music or through the film or through both. And I feel right. like you have a lot of kind of some really very beautiful um, surrealist kind of um, uh, nuances in your album, The Why Because and She Said. Um, so why don't we start talking about the why? Because um, you do, you have, you cover, well, not cover, but you have your own version of Time in My Life, which is this really beautiful, um, kind of dreamy, ethereal, acoustic guitar version of Time in My Life, and then a pretty true version, um, true to the original cut of Hungry Eyes that I got to sing background on. <laughs> um, and also, you've got some originals on there and a cover of my dad's song, I Am Not Willing. For those of you who don't know, my dad's Peter Lewis from Moby Grape. And we're talking to John D. Nicola here. Uh, John D. Nicola has produced records for my dad, Peter Lewis, and myself, and um, or a record for me. And for what it's, it's, I was reading your bio and it said for I Am Not Willing, uh, you were just in the studio with Jake and Jake was playing the drums and you were just kind of having fun with the song. And it ended up that, by the way, that recording is just outstanding. It's like very true to the vibe of the original Moby Grape um, recording to it. But it has a little more of a shimmer, which I really like. I really love. Did you play that electric guitar? Because I really love that. Yeah. So I believe I played everything. Uh, maybe not the piano. I think I played everything and Jake played drums. And um, I think Alan Zahn, our okay. mutual friend, played the piano. If I remember, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was this guy named Plink, Plinky, Plinky, guy named Plinky from New Jersey. Nice. That uh, played good. piano. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, I I I had just moved um, equipment into my barn recording mm -hmm. studio to get my recording studio up here. And we set the drums up with just a few mics and Jake came in and I was just trying to get a feel for the room and, and get a, a sound and see how the room sounded. And um, I, I said, Jake, let's just play, um, you know, I am not willing. Yeah. And so that's how that started. And, and, and then um, I put my voice, I put, I built the track. Uh, I think I played guitar to lay it down with with um, Jake and um, built all the tracks up. I sent uh, got a Plinky to play piano, and then I said, "Well, let me just throw a vo vocal down on it." You know, I, again, I, I've never thought of myself as a lead singer, and um, you know, sounded pretty good. So that that sort of kicked off the why because, um, uh, and then I started thinking, well, what other songs could I do and um, it, why because is um my first record as an artist and it contains songs uh i had written for other artists right um including the time of my life and hungry eyes and a song for john Waite, and some of them were songs that were written for other artists that they didn't do so uh i just i just did them it just i i kind of looked through my catalog and said well what what could i what could i sing what's what sounds like it could be a song i would do and um and and that's how that happened we had another song that was you're the only one which opens the album and it was in a um 
um, Sylvester Stallone movie called Avenging Angelo, uh, sung by Steve Holy, our country singer. That I love that song. And we're going to um, we're going to play that today. We're actually so we're going to head out to break. Um, we're going to play Float on Hope. That's from She Said. And then we're going to play Bring Everybody Back In with You Are the Only One from the album The Why Because that we're discussing now. Uh, you're listening to Arwen Lewis on the Arwen Lewis radio show. My very special guest is a uh, songwriter, John D. Nicola. And we're playing excerpts from his music today and talking about his amazing career in the music business. And we'll be right back. Please enjoy Float on Hope. 